Hey everyone, so in this video I want to talk to you about white space and leaving spaces unpainted and where this came from is um, a follower on the Urban Sketching World Instagram profile. Uh, his name is Sorab Tajadin and he asked a fantastic question. So he said, um, I noticed that some urban sketchers create superb pieces by leaving out lots of white areas. Could you please explain when and how to leave out the white space? Um, so it's an amazing question and I thought to myself, I could direct him maybe to a blog post, maybe I should write a blog post or maybe I could direct him to some other resources. But I thought actually it would be an amazing idea to actually do a YouTube video on this very topic because it's actually something I wonder about too. I love it when I see other sketches leaving out um, certain parts of their sketch, leaving it white or unpainted or whatever and directing the viewer's eye into certain areas of the composition or the sketch. Um, and it's something I have dabbled with here and there, but I sort of kind of forget about it and then I see it and I'm like, oh, I really love that. But I don't know, for some reason when I do it, it seems to be, it seems to almost look unfinished to my eyes, but then I know I'll show it to someone else and they'll be like, oh, I really like that. Like, I really like that kind of style. So it's a difficult one. And because it's not something I'm um, particularly experienced with, I thought to myself, maybe I should talk to someone else. Maybe I should ask someone else um, who is, who does do this, like in their work all the time. And for me, the first person that sprang to mind is an artist called John Harrison um, from the UK. And I've been following him on Instagram for, I don't even know how long, but I, his, you know, his work's in the forefront of my mind. So maybe like a couple of years or something like that. And I know um, very specifically that he is the master at doing this stuff. Um, he's an urban sketcher, he runs workshops and courses and that kind of thing. And yeah, he was the first person that sprang into my mind. So I didn't really think any further. I was like, I wonder if I could just speak to John about this and get his view. So, um, very kindly, John has agreed to speak with me and so yeah I'm gonna talk to him now and we'll get his view on things. So I hope this conversation is super useful to you guys. Stick around until after the conversation with John because I might just put his tips into practice and do a bit of a demo slash have a bit of a go myself at uh, this kind of technique. So enjoy the conversation but stick around to the end for the demo. Okay. First of all, though, I would uh, like to know a little bit more about uh, how you kind of came to sketching, because I think if I'm correct in saying, I think I saw that you're like self-taught and that kind of thing. So, yeah, um, yeah, I'd love to know a little bit more about how you kind of got into sketching. Well, I've always drawn ever since I was old enough to, to, to grasp a pencil, you know, four or five, I can remember sketching um, and drawing. And um, yeah, I, I can't remember a time in my slightly long life now um, where I never, I've never drawn, apart from a period in the 70s where I was, um, I was a professional drummer in a, in a couple of bands. So I, I earned my living doing that oh. in the 70s. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah, there okay. you go. Um, but from mid 70s to about oh, late 80s, I didn't do much because I, I, I retrained when the bands kind of collapsed in the 70s. Yeah. I retrained as a graphic designer. Yeah. And when I, when I learned the mechanics of graphic design, um, you learn, I, I learned using these things. I learned to, to draw and, and, and sketch. So I was very, very, you know, there, there wasn't any, any clip art knocking around. If you wanted a logo, you drew it yourself and, yeah. and, and you, you took bromides and you pasted them in. So I learned my pen skills um, mm. from graphic design. And I remember when I was, when I was kind of doing uh, designs, I would, uh, I would consciously design something that had an illustrative element into it. And then I'd get the job of drawing the thing. So I did, I did, I remember doing one that was for a, in the late 80s for a cheese delicatessen up in North Yorkshire. Yeah. And I drew a, a cheese body uh, uh, and I thought, I'm going to make this look like a wood, a woodcut 
print. Yeah. And I was really chuffed. And I can't, I've been searching on and off over the last five, six years to find a copy because oh, it was yeah. kind of my early thing. And I'd love to, I'd love to see it, but I'm sure I will one of these days. So that's how I got into, uh, I got back into sketching through graphic design. Um, and then in about 20, I had my own design and print business. And in about 2008, 2009, when the financial thing happened, mm -hmm. um, my company was torpedoed by uh, a couple of banks and an unscrupulous partner who was robbing us all blind. So pull the plug on that. And when I, I went back to work for my old boss, um, and then I kind of found out, I found art clubs. And okay. a, a neighbour on the street said, oh, you've got spare time now. Why don't you knew what happened? Come yeah. to the art club. And that was the start of it. I thought, I had no idea that these places existed where people went to, to meet and chat. Um, and she said, you'd be very popular because I, I like to draw buildings and, and townscapes and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, and that was it. And yeah. it, it, a second career took off, and then within a year, I was doing demonstrations to art clubs and running work, then running workshops. And, and it was all I'm I kind of thinking, well, what can I do? What can I show people? Um, and about that time, I discovered the urban sketching movement, and it was wow. Because I've got this, I've got this love of stuff that looks slightly unfinished. Where you can see all the construction lines, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you can see the thinking behind it, rather than a highly polished, finished piece of artwork that look, looks as though it's taken hours or days. Uh, and to see these quick sketches, you know, getting prominence, I thought. Oh, so I, I found out how how you got involved, and I got involved with the local Yorkshire chap uh, chapter. Um, went out sketching. Um, but then my, my kind of the success, the growing success of, of doing demonstrations and, ca and, and workshops and things yeah. meant that I could no longer get to every meeting, which I really, really regret now because, you know, there's nothing like going out with a group of 10 or 12 people. Mm. Um, and then, of course, fast forwarding, that all went by the by with, with COVID. So yeah. um, and these virtual things are, are not the same. You know, no. go on Google Maps and draw a building. It's it's just not the same. Um, but yeah, that's how I got into drawing. And and people seek to because I do line and wash slightly differently to how traditional line and wash is, is taught. Mm -hmm. It seemed to it seemed to ring a bell with a lot of people saying, Oh, oh I like that. Yeah, yeah. And and it wasn't it, they're not traditional watercolours by any uh, any stretch of anybody's imagination. Um and how, and that, do, how did you work your way into like finding that style where it is kind of just the, um, you know, it's mainly line work with sort of a, a splash of, of colour? Like, how did you find your it's, way to that? Did that just happen organically or? It, it did. I, I've always been drawn to, sorry if you pardon the pun, I've always been drawn to stuff that's a bit more graphic. Mm. So, and I can remember seeing a, in around probably about the same time, mid-2008, 2009, seeing lots of, I saw some prints somewhere where there were just line work and the only thing, there were coastal scenes, which mm. is another, another love of mine. I love to get to the Yorkshire coast. Um, and it was line work and the only colour was either just a flat blue sky or a different tone of the sea. And I really liked that because I think those, those blocks of colour, are yeah, they were digitally added, yeah. but they seemed to throw the line drawing into real focus. And I thought, yeah, and that. So I spent some time trying to recreate that, and then rapidly found that, that you can't do it with a watercolour wash, yeah, because um, you know the way watercolour behaves, you can't get this flat thing. Mm -hmm. Although it didn't stop me trying, um, and it just it just evolved from there, and and I, it, but. I, it didn't, I didn't suddenly have this, this, this blinding revelation where, oh, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Because I still try other, uh, you know, continually I'll, I'll spot somebody on Instagram and think, wow, I'm going to have a crack at that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's really, really wild colour washes, but I still have to come back to this. It's the graphic designer in me. It's, everything's got to be neat and tidy and finished off, but I try and stop and... and 
it's the most it's the most difficult thing in the world to 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 be loose when your inclination is to be really really tight and, and, and tidy um and and the using the color thing uh, I, I realize that you could you could add focus you know if you've got a big drawing yeah yeah um if you add color to everywhere your viewer's eyes got nowhere to nowhere to look so mm. if i um I haven't got the sketchbook with me um, that's got the, the one that kind of clinched. It was a view of states, it stays on the North Yorkshire coast mm. of a harbour. Um, and I just used some colour in the in the central bit that led up a street, and that's had 100,000 views now on Flickr. Is that and the one you comment, just recently did a video demonstration of? No, uh, not that one. Okay, okay. Um, I might go. I might go back to it um, and revisit it because it's. But I, I think if I do that, um, if I keep going back and revisit stuff, mm. it's kind of cheating. Like I quickly worked out that in, in the art club world, mm. there's these demonstrators that go around clubs and they've got a finite number of images that they use, um, and they kind of cycle them around and you can tell that they're doing a practiced and tired routine. So I swore at the beginning that for every club, every demonstration, every workshop, I would do a completely new piece. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rob for me on back, because finding a new, a new image. Yeah. So I'm just scrolling down. I'm going to find this um, on my other internet device here. Um, but having said that, you know, this, this using color to focus I still, there it is. Oh, wrong one. There you go. I'll hold this up to the camera, look. Yeah. Um, it was that one. Uh, okay. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah. And it's just the, um, just the colour there. And, you know, there are a couple of hills in states that, that kind of sh shelter the, the thing. But it just seemed obvious to just focus on there. Uh, sorry, I'm, uh, like on the roof, just roofs roofs and, and, coming roofs the, and the shadows yeah. going up that street. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so that's the one that really, uh, really cemented it. I thought, yeah, yeah, there's something here. And then I went off and started to think, well, I've got to paint full pictures, which is not the thing because at workshops, the most common comment I've got is you're using a lot more colour than you normally do. And I think, whoa, hang on. So I've got a style. That's when I realised there was this thing. Um, people like know yeah. you for yeah yeah yeah. Plus and the the other reason the other reason for only using colour in a section is that I am a Yorkshireman and paint's not cheap. So <laughs> there you go. There we go. And um, so how do you like how do you decide when you're sort of out urban sketching? How do you decide what what's going to be your focal point? Like, it's just instinct. It is instinct. Um, okay. Yeah, people say they struggle with composition, but even mm. if I'm if I'm outside and I can pick a scene, or if I take a reference picture, I do most of the pre-editing mm -hmm. up here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I won't take a panoramic view and then then just I'm going to do this bit. I'll already know, and it's just an instinctive thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you can go on for hours and hours about composition, yeah. but, you know, the rule of thirds mm -hmm. and that basic rule about never have your focus slap bang in the middle of your canvas because it, it, it never works. Yeah. Um, so just moving around. Um, and when I'm out, I, I never paint outdoors. It's always, I always just take um, a sketchbook Did and nice. a couple of pens. Yeah. Um, do the line work out there and a, a reference photograph, then I could come back. Mm -hmm. And if... Nine times out of ten, until I get the watercolour mixed, I'm not sure which part's just going to have colour. Um, but sometimes, you know, the odd, the, odd, the odd time I'll know, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to focus on that side of that building or, you know, that group of, um, group of trees there is going to be the colour in the, in the, in the townscape. Mm. So it's, it, it's mainly instinct and... That's the hardest thing to kind of teach anybody, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And do you? Because when I've kind of tried 
to do this maybe like once or twice just I think probably like you I've been I've looked at other people's work on Instagram and been like oh I like that I want to try that that probably yeah. happened actually I probably saw your work and I was like oh I really like that style I want to have a go at that but then I never know where when to stop and because yeah. and and then it just like yeah. looks I don't know if it just looks unfinished but then maybe that is part of the style like you were saying you like and I'm the same I love sketches where you can see the construction lines and it's all a bit of a it is sketchy by the very like nature of it you know so it's like difficult to know where to stop but i suppose it's, it just, it's just an instinctual thing and you kind of just keep doing it and keep doing it and then i don't know yeah yeah you develop it yeah. but that's a comment i've had an awful lot um mm. uh, you know at, the, at an art club demonstration you might get 20 30 people there yeah. and the majority of people come up afterwards and say that's lovely it's great can i take a picture blah 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 and then you'll always get one or two and it's usually a usually an old bloke who'll come up and say it's not a bad drawing lad but it'd be all right when you finished it <laughs> finished and you think, <laughs> right so i've just spent two hours expounding on why i don't fill the whole thing in because there are hundreds thousands of other far more able watercolorist than I am and why I do it the way I do but are you going to put stuff in you know you're going to finish that it would yeah. be all right and yeah. I've had comments left on things online about it would be all right when it's finished um but it, it, it's what happens it's what people what people think it's it's amazing how you've got I look at it I think that's finished and the comment you've just made about you never know when to stop mm. um completely true mm. I've, I've, you know I've, I've over egged the pudding on so many pieces yeah. of work it's unreal yeah. um you know and the thing is you never know when to stop but you always know when you've done too much yeah you always know you can look um and i i try at workshop i could say right we'll set a timer yeah and you've got to you've got an hour to finish it and and that that in itself you know that constraint helps you know the yeah. fact that you haven't got three or four hours yeah yeah to like fiddle around endlessly with things yeah, and yeah okay so that would probably be like a, a really good tip for people is uh to a practice time limit. with with a time limit yeah. okay yeah, yeah. That's whatever that is i mean i i'm i'm fairly fairly fortunate i can work really quickly i can do a a really good you know line none of this none of the drawings in this took more than 20 25 minutes yeah um so I can say if I limit myself to half an hour, I can comfortably complete something in half an hour. Mm. Some people might go, "Oh, good grief, half an hour! I haven't got the lines ruled out." Like you know, it's that kind of thing. Um, it's entirely up to what people think. Yeah. If they normally take four hours, set yourself an hour. Yeah. Not ten minutes. I think that's the thing. I think I, for some reason, no matter what I'm drawing, it's always an hour and a half. I've, and I, I'm like, well, I don't even know what I was doing in that hour and a half, but yeah. it just always seems yeah. to be an hour and a half. So uh, I need to aspire to the half an hour. That would be good. I'd get a lot more drawing yeah. done, maybe. And with the regards to the, doing the watercolour afterwards, is that just um, a convenience thing, not doing it on location? Is that? It, it is, um, but it, it, it stems from my, I got my love of drawing and the way I, I I put line work in and then add colour. I got that from comic books. Oh, really? You know, in, yeah. In, in the 60s. You know, like the Beano and the Dandy and the, yeah. the British ones. And, and Rupert the Bear was a massive influence on me. Yeah. And looking back, once I got old enough to find out how they, how they produced these, these things, exactly the way I did. Yeah. Somebody would do a pencil illustration. Somebody would then ink that in. And then somebody else would add colour. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm exactly the same as I do, except I don't do any pencil. I just go straight in with a pen. Um, and you'd, you'd be amazed at how many people think, what, you know, pencil? <gasps> I can't yeah. run with a pen. What if you put a line in the wrong place? You can't rub it out. Well, just incorporate it. Pretend you meant, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's a piece of paper and a, and, a, and a few lines. If you ruin it, you get another piece of paper. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. I think it could be a massive like psychological block for people, isn't it? Oh, like, yeah, I definitely yeah. have had to, and I probably still have it to a degree, but I've definitely had to overcome that fear of the blank page and yeah, doing, you know, 
So now I try and I force myself to only do like basic shapes in pencil just to make sure everything like fits on the page or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, not fuss over any details and then go in with the pen and draw the whole thing. But it just so I yeah. like, it's almost like a safety blanket. It's just making sure everything fits on the page and like the rough proportions are right maybe. And then kind of go in with the pen. But um, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You have to think of it like, um, it's it's just a piece of paper if i mess it up i mess it up it's just the f a it's having fun doing it and b if it's you know disaster just turn the page and start on an another page you know absolutely yeah. yeah yeah and um does this um kind of technique i mean i can't think off the top of my head like of any I mean, I'm sure there are other people that do this kind of technique, but does it does it have a name or anything, or like how do you refer to it in any way? No, okay, it's just no, no, yeah, okay. It's just, I thought I'd ask. Um, I don't know if I'm missing something here. Is it like actually called something? I don't know. No, I think I tried to think because I remember in, in on the graphic design course I went on, mm. I remember one of the tutors said, "Don't be afraid of white space," mm. and that kind of went in. Because the number, you know, in design terms, if you're designing an A4 leaflet or something, yeah. and you present the design and there's white space, clients will always go, oh, can we put a logo there, another picture there, and suddenly it's filled up. Well, that's that's the um, that's the process, that's the theory behind what I do, because it's it's un uncluttered. Yeah. Um, and I prefer, you know, lots of white space. It's, it's, it's a brave thing to have... Um, to have to leave lots and lots un undrawn up like that. There you go, there's one. Yeah, yeah. This is just, I've nearly finished this sketchbook look. Oh, yeah. Um, and there, there's another one where I've just used sky and a bit of greenery. You just this, have to this be is brave. My, the, this is my daily sketchbook. I have this in the car, and when I go, take the dog for a walk every morning, yeah. then I can sit down and, and do a drawing. So some of them are just literally, that's the car park. Oh, that's I'm great. Just yeah. and, and just, that's, that's a 10-minute sketch. Wow. Literally okay. 10 minutes. And at the moment, I, just adding that blue is enough for me. Because mm. if I go on, I can't remember what colour the cars were. Um I know what colour the roof and the thing is, but I think that would detract and it, it just so I'm just leaving that as it is. Yeah. And that kind of works. Yeah. And in in terms of deciding what to paint and what not to paint, yeah. there are a couple of there are a couple of theories, techniques. One is to when I I don't think I've got any in here. Um, but when I if I do a um, no I haven't. When I do a, a like a, a country scene with a a dry stone wall or a barn or a cottage in it yeah or something in the lakes generally rule of thumb i will tend to leave anything that's man-made just as line work so buildings walls barns ah, okay. telegraph poles yeah so and then then just put the color in the landscape oh that's interesting okay okay so this is what you were talking about with leaving the uh like the the, the wall uh unpainted Le yeah le le Leaving the man-made stuff, the structures, Mammy. the yeah. wall, the buildings. Yeah. Um, there is there, um, there's some greenery dropping yeah. down over the wall. Um, if I'd put green in there, it would have suddenly taken your focus away from the centre, which is what I was after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. exactly it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And um, this is, so this, this is uh, a print that you, is it a print or an original? I don't know. A print that you're That's selling? That's an original. Yeah. That's an original. Yeah. Um, through, and you've got uh, quite a few for sale through the artist support pledge thing that is, has been quite big on Instagram. Can you get, oh, can you big. mention that, that quickly? Yeah. Is that all right? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it, it was started by a chap called Matthew... <laughs> chap called Matthew Burroughs. Yeah. And it 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 start it was started that when at the beginning of the pandemic, when um when galleries and, and normal ways of, of kind of selling your work uh, suddenly disappeared overnight. Mm. Um and it was a pledge that you post all your work, offer it for sale at less than two hundred pounds or two hundred dollars, 
or 200, whatever your currency is in the country you're in. Yeah. And you pledge that if you sell enough pieces, that once you've reached a thousand pounds of turnover, you then pledge to buy another piece from other artists. And yeah. th there's no formal enrollment. You just, you just post the tagline and the, um, the, you know, the selling, the artist support pledge logo thing. Yeah. And it's worked well. I'm, I'm still nowhere near a thousand pounds, but I've still bought quite a few pieces from artists I know. Yeah. And it works really well. In that's fact, of the five that I posted last week, that one that's on your screen is the yeah. only one left. Oh, is it? Okay. Okay. So the oh, that's have, great. The, the others have all gone, which is oh, good. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. But I've got plenty more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> got to get so to that I, 1,000. I may repeat it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. No, that's great. That's great. And, um, and this one that I'm showing, so, and I love yeah. how you've, you've, um, I think I read in the description as well, you've kind of like got these little sketch notes as well, kind of at the top there, you've got a bit of like random, I don't know. Was yeah, it they, they were, because all of these pieces started the life as a demonstration piece oh, or in a workshop. Okay. Yeah. Um, because when I work flat yeah. on the, on the table, I've got an overhead camera um, and it project. I've got a projector, and it projects onto a wall or a screen. So oh, as nice. people fire questions, yeah. uh, how do you do this? How do you, I'll, I'll make notes. Uh, and this has come because I work on a for all my finished pieces and, and, and demo pieces. They're all on a sheet of quarter imperial, which is about fifteen by eleven inches. Mm. But the painting in the middle, the drawing in the middle, is about a four size. So there's mm. a lot of margin around the outside, um, and I'll do paint testing i'll do scribbles i'll, I'll demonstrate te quick technique in the margin yeah um, funnily enough when i've sold those um i'll say well look do you want it in a mount i'll crop it no 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 i want it with all uh, the, all the, the stuff, stuff around the, the edges edge. yeah i think yeah, i think it's yeah. great it's it's just i don't know it just adds a bit of a bit more like soul to it i don't know if that's the right word but yeah, yeah. it's just uh, yeah I don't know, it's nice and it and it all goes back to what we were talking about earlier about li liking to see Lacking like unfinished, not unfinished, but you can see the thought behind it. You can see um, it, it. It is rough and it is unfinished um, until you put a mount on it and you crop it down, and then it suddenly becomes just a pretty image. Yeah, and I, yeah. I prefer to see all the all the thought that's gone behind it. It's gone yeah, into it's it. like the story, isn't it? Like the story behind exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so in this one, you're um, again, you're kind of directing the eye into that sort of central house there. Is that um, was it, that was the thing that kind of caught your eye about this scene? So you decided to to fully paint that house and then just do some kind of shadows. And then leave the rest. Yeah. The thing that caught my eye was that the, the strong sunlight in there that, that created mm. those really strong, really yeah, strong yeah. dark shadow. Yeah. That's not black. It's a mixture of Payne's Grey and some indigo. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Because the only pure black on there are the the, the pen lines, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and to see people, you know, in, in the progress of a demo, um, they'll always say, "Well, what are you not going to paint?" And I'm thinking, "Well, I don't know yet. Ask me in ten minutes when I see how it evolves." But for that one, it was it was really obvious to me to leave that gable end. Yeah. Uh, unpainted and the wall and that roof unpainted but then put some nice color in there so in sometimes the sometimes it just clicks and you just know you you're like you can see it in your head so like what you want yeah. to do with it yeah yeah okay oh, well cool. not not sometimes most of the time most of the time okay okay most of the time it, it clicks but i have to it's very rare i sit down to do a piece and plan and think yeah i know i'm only going to paint that door blue mm. um but it's just, yeah, again, it's just an instinct. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, experience and, and doing it so often that you kind of know what to look for. Yeah, you know what will, what will work. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And um, I, I noticed sort of this bit of a sideline, but I noticed are you, you're using quite like a fine, like maybe a, a 0 0.05 kind of pen generally for your, your drawing or a 0 0.1 or something? Yeah, in... In, in these sketchbooks, all the line work is started with a 0 0.1 yeah. or even a 0 0.05. Yeah. But for demonstrations, 
I found out very quickly, if I started off, because there's a camera about six feet above my above the drawing board, yeah. Uh, if you do a 0.05, and because you're reliant on ambient light in the room, I haven't got any dedicated light, but I looked around and I couldn't see anything on the screen, even though they were there. They were like very, very faint pencil lines. So I will always start with a 0.1 or perhaps even a 0.2. Mm. Um, when I'm doing a demonstration for people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because even with, you know, the, these technical pens, even if it's a broad nib, you, you can you can make it finer by tilting it and, and kind of drawing with the shoulder of the nib yeah. um, and, and lessening the pressure. Yeah. That's, and then that's that's another, the dis doing it. another distinctive part of your uh, style, what you're doing here is that you... you maybe at the end or, or whenever, I don't know, um, you thicken some some chosen lines up quite a lot to yeah. kind of bring things out. Yes. And um, how, how do you decide which like which parts of the sketch you do that to? Is it stuff that you want that, that should sit forward or? Well, that, that, that comes, again, there's an instinct that you mm. know that if, if, if every one of your lines is the same weight, yeah. They're all competing for your attention. Mm -hmm. um, but I know, for instance, I think in architectural terms, they're called profile lines. Uh, you know, okay. if, and I learned this because I've had, on workshops, I've, I've had my fair share of um, retired architects. And I, I always go into a blind panic when mm -hmm. I realise there's a, a retired architect there. Yeah, God, what can I teach you? <laughs> And there was one, one chap, he could draw unbelievably well, uh, but it, it was the colour. And he said, you know, he spent the morning, I said, be loose, hold your, hold your brush way off the end and kind of stand back. Mm. Um, but by the afternoon, he reverted. Uh, but he'd been an architect for 45 years, and he reverted back to really, really precise mm -hmm. colour mm -hmm. rendering on all his drawings. But he preferred the one he did in the morning where he was kind of loose, um, and spattering. Um, yeah. yeah, it's generally, and, and, and again, another pal of mine um, who came on a workshop, and it's a chap called Brian Ramsey. Yeah. Uh, he, um, he's on Instagram. You need to look at some of his stuff. It's just Brian phenomenal. Ramsey. Okay. Brian Ramsey. Yeah. And he said that he was taught, his, his, he, was a, um, he was taught architectural um, illustration. If you could imagine any shape in your drawing, if there was a fly crawling across it, and if it could disappear by going over a line, then you then you then you emphasise that line. Uh, but okay. if it crossed a line and it didn't disappear from view, then you leave that in the fine work. And so that, that, that's a, I don't know if you can see that. There you go. If, if if you look at that's one I did on Instagram. One of these fantastic. Um, draw this in your style challenge. Oh, I love but those. You can see yeah. it, it's very obvious there, look. The yes. end of that building. Yeah. And then the end of that bit, the furthest ones away. And then it just it, it creates layers within yeah. the within the drawing. And that one of that one of um Yeah, this is the again. yeah, this is the video I saw yeah. earlier actually. Yeah, yeah. Where the roof line and it pulls it forward from the it really pulls it forward from the background. It really does. Um, yeah. Because one of the, by adding, drawing the lines first and then putting the colour in later, yeah. um, sometimes you find that the washes overpower the fine lines. Mm, mm -hmm. So you, you go back in and add them afterwards. But definitely along the roof line, that's, that's a good one. A, a good um, rule of thumb, just, you know, the roof lines to pull the, pull the buildings pull. away. And in yeah. fact, I think on that one, yeah, it is only the, the roof lines that, yeah. that had uh, profile so lines or emphasis lines. Yeah, so you're still being selective there with, with, with whereabouts you do, like you didn't do it on the railings, for example. Um, uh, no, I didn't. Yeah. You I did that. To, I guess to still create emphasis in one part of the drawing rather than, rather than everything. Yeah, that's what it should be because that... When I when I started, I thought right, I must put profile lines there, and then 
I would normally go along the top of the railings and didn't in ah, that one. Okay, okay. I might, I might do it now. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I think it would be cool maybe just to offer some people, um, offer people some, like maybe some tips or a summary of, or a bit of advice how they can get started with trying this kind of style out. Um, right. The first one, the only one I can I could suggest is if you if you find a scene that you like, let me find one quickly. Okay. Like that, this one. Find something that's got an obvious pop of colour. Like that was yeah. a draw. This. Okay. And that it's some kind of machinery there. Yeah. And to me, as soon as I saw that, I thought because there is colour in the rest of the buildings, but look for a pop of colour. Yeah. You know, the cliched one is a red front door or, um, you know, something, uh, that piece of machinery there. And it really, it really pops out. Yeah. It's super um, graphic. Yeah. 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 And one of the other ones is, let me find one of these, um, like that one. Yes. Yeah. That was done from inside the car. Mm-hmm. Leave the trees just as graphic shapes, yeah, and then it's something in the distance. But the biggest tip I can uh, let me see if I can draw it out. If you've got um, if you've got a reference photograph or yeah. a scene that you're doing, um, and you do you do the drawing, the whole pencil thing. Let me find one. You do the whole pencil thing. Um, so you've got your drawing, and then if you do it all in pen. Then one of the one of the most simple ways of, of, of trying not to colour the whole thing in mm -hmm. would be to get a pencil and do an oval or a circle and just quickly do that shape and confine your colour to within that shape ah, okay. and leave everything outside. I think it's I think you could call that a vignette. Yeah. And it can be any shape. It can be it can be a circle or you can have a square. Or with it, if, if it was this composition, you could say, right, anything that's to the right of that gatepost and to the left of that, I'll put all the colour in there and leave all this yes. just as lines. That's such a good tip. And that's, that's a simple way, yeah. Yeah. And if ever, you, if, if, if ever you're drawing and painting and you find yourself looking from side to side, think, right, I'll put, shall I put there? If you have to ponder about where to put colour, don't. Okay. Yeah. 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 Don't don't look for some. Oh, I'll I'll just put some there and then some there. No. Just leave it. Just put uh, just put the colour down in one go and don't go back in and fiddle with it and leave it. Yeah. Put your brush yeah. down and, and carry on drawing down there. Yeah. Okay. See, it's really it's really difficult when something's instinctive or natural to try and break it down to to uh, well why do I because if I start thinking about it too much I'll never do it yeah I know yeah. exactly what you mean yeah when if you're trying to I've just uh I've just finished filming an online course so taking people wow. through three separate projects that uh, in the way that I I would do it you know or that I would travel sketch mm. or, or you know my process um, my comfort zone that I always return to no matter if I experiment it's always the the comfort zone that I return to and um, it is really hard to actually just break it down mm. into the stages and really think about what you're doing because it's like god when I sit down and I sketch I'm just I just do it I just don't really think about it but obviously mm. you know in my case I've picked up all these things along the way over the last several years and it's just become so as you say instinctive and part of the process yeah it's, yeah. it's difficult to then step back and analyze it and break it down for people but um i think those those tips are like awesome they're they're really really useful and i think after i've spoken to you i'm going to try and give it a go and i'm going to record it as well for everyone to see so <laughs> we're going to experiment and we're uh, oh, i'm going to do i'm going to attempt it myself and see we'll see how it comes out because i think that'll be fun excellent marvelous so before we get on to the demo uh, using some of John's tips, I just wanted to let you guys know that I do have an online course available now that I sort of alluded to a little bit earlier in my conversation with John. It is called Sketchy Adventures in Ink and Watercolour. It's over seven hours 
video lessons and we work through three different projects um, from a photo reference that I have taken along the way during my travels. Uh, so the first project is we're, we're going to keep it relatively simple and we're going to do street furniture and specifically we shall sketch some road signs. Um, I took this picture when I was traveling Route 66 which was still hands down one of my most favorite trips and I just really I thought it was quite iconic and I just really loved this and I, I could see that it was going to make a good sketch so uh, and I think it's a really nice kind of introduction you know it's like some reasonably basic shapes some slightly harder ones and I think you can have a lot of fun with it as well so we even have a bonus lesson where we get a bit more experimental and see kind of how we can play around with just such a simple subject matter. Project two then builds on and is a tiny bit more complex and we are focusing on an ornate kind of doorway um, that I saw in Valletta in Malta. I absolutely love uh, ornate doors and windows and things like that. They're super fun to sketch. So I was pretty keen to include this project in the course. And again, it's kind of, it's still fairly simple subject matter, but it does take things kind of a, a step further. And it would be something that is probably very relevant to you and, you know, what you might want to sketch along your travels, you know, little vignettes, like little doors and things like that. And then project three then takes things further again and we do an entire building. So in this case, I've picked a building that I saw in Mexico. It's actually a building I used to walk to pass to and from to silversmithing school in 2019 when I was living in Mexico. And I just absolutely love the colour of it. I loved the characteristics of it, and I just really love the mess of cables that are that are over the you know over the top of it. So that's that's what we're gonna. That's the projects that we're gonna work through. You can check the course out in the description below. I've got a link to it. And yeah, I just think if you are into my kind of illustration style. If you want to expand your travel sketching skills, especially in time for lockdown coming to an end, if you want to work on your travel sketching skills right now, this is the time to do it. And I think this is the course for you. So yeah, hit the link in the description below. You get a bit more information and you can have a look and see what you think. But I really hope you guys join in. Loads of people have signed up already. I'm starting to see people's projects and it's just really amazing. And it's given people the confidence, you know, to really get into their materials um, and this is kind of like a step-by-step -step process of how I would how I would sketch these um, elements uh, so that two of the three are from my book sketchy adventures around the world which is about the last three years of my travels from 2017 to 2020 so again the link is in the description below so do check it out I think you'll find it really fun to look at um, especially again if you like the style of illustration and travel sketching that I do. If you have any questions at all please don't hesitate to give me a shout taria at urbansketchingworld.com So now let's get into the demo. I'm calling it a demo but it's basically just me having a go at um, John's style really. So I'm using this 0.2 fine liner because that's the thinnest one I have. My 0.1's run out and I don't have a 0.05 anymore and I'm using this 0.7 as my thickest line because, again, that's just all I have. I definitely need to buy some new fine liners at some point. And I'm using a big brush. I'm using the Escoda Reserva uh, Travel Brush, which is size 10. Got my jar of water, got my paper towel, and I'm going to use my usual, my White Knights watercolours, which are a mess uh, at the moment, but... Uh, I rarely get round to washing out the tin, I can just never be bothered and then I pick up to paint and I just want to paint so it just stays like that so that's fine. And I'm going to set myself a timer uh, much like John suggested. So I am I know that I'm pretty, hmm, maybe I'm pretty slow or uh, this is, you know, I'm doing this for the first time so I'm not going to do 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm not even going to do 30 minutes. I'm going to set a timer for 40 minutes. So I'm giving myself plenty of time because I feel like, you know, I am trying to work this out. And yeah, I feel like 40 minutes is a good amount of time. So I'm using my Hannah Muller just watercolor travel sketchbook here, just A5 size. And I've got this reference photo. I actually got it off a website called unsplash.com, which I'm sure a lot of you've heard of. So it's just lots of nice high resolution images over there that you can use for free. 
And so in honour of John, this picture is from Yorkshire, although Yorkshire is admittedly a big place. I'm not sure which part of Yorkshire, or a big county, should I say. I'm not sure which part of Yorkshire John's from. Anyway, this picture is of a place called Whitby. Um, so it's kind of really cool. You've got like the beach in the foreground, which actually I didn't get into the sketch, but then you've got these kind of houses. Then you've got this kind of crazy like hillside and then this castle just like looming in the background so I thought it was a pretty fun picture to sketch if you guys want to use the same reference picture then I've put a link to it in the uh, description below so to the website where you can you can download it for free um, so go check that out so yeah I'm just using my 0.2 fine liner and just going around and drawing you know drawing in as wherever I feel like it you can see I'm not sort of doing it in any logical fashion to be honest with you I'm just sort of building it out but I think that's okay you know I think you can start in one place and just build out in one direction and then if you get a bit bored then or you get a bit stuck then move out in a different direction and it kind of all just comes together I wouldn't worry about trying to do it in any logical fashion just do whatever you feel like it's fine and as you will notice I went straight in with my pen which I really should get into the habit of doing, but I'm always a little bit too scared to, so I like to just put in some comfort blanket lines with my pencil and uh, just to, I don't know, I don't know, it's a psychological barrier, I think, but that's fine, It's there's no right or wrong way, it just saves a bit of time if you do go in with pen, but then you, you know, you're at the, the mercy of making mistakes that you might not have made if you went in with pencil, but, you know, if you're sketching on the fly, you're out travel sketching, urban sketching, whatever, obviously drawing straight in pen is like of quite you know it's quite beneficial really in terms of saving a bit of time um so I think maybe because I've been drawing from home quite a lot more during this whole covid lockdown thing I've kind of got a bit more back into the habit of using a pencil so anyway there's no right or wrong way that's fine so um yeah I finished my as much as the pen lines that I wanted to really and I was like right I want to get into uh putting in some paint so I'm just taking my my yellows and my greens and doing a bit of wet and wet so it, it took me a little while to decide which bits to paint and which not to paint and as you can see my time is already on I've got two minutes left so I was like okay well I've kind of failed at that to in fairness though I did mess around for a few minutes trying to get my music to play on my computer yeah <laughs> anyway um I'm debating whether I should have actually painted the green hedge kind of garden bits in the bottom left hand corner there but that's fine you know and I feel like I should have used stronger maybe some stronger pigments in the wet and wet because it kind of came out the green and the yellow and stuff I don't know it's just not quite as John like as I would like um, but now I'm going around and just thickening up some certain lines with that 0.7 and oh, it just really makes things stand out really nice I really like it oh and the other bit I like is the sky I, I, I know in the picture it's got a bright blue sky but I wanted to go for something a bit more moody so I used like an indigo um, pretty much and outlines uh, sorry and painted in the sky put in a few splatters so I was so tempted to paint in these roofs like this reddish orange color um, but I was like, no, restraint. I was like, I'm not going to do that. Although I might go back in and do it just for fun, just to see what it looks like now I've done this demo. But yeah, it's quite, it really does take a lot to like restrain yourself to not paint in certain things. But I was looking at it and I was like, nah, I just need something a bit more. So I decided to put in really strong shadows in the castle with a black brush pen, which I know John not, not wouldn't have done necessarily. He might have used watercolour, but... For some reason, I picked up the brush pen and did that, but that's fine, you know. It still gives the overall vibe, I think, that I was going for. Um, and again, I was super painted, um, super tempted to paint in these rock bits on the hill that I'm just putting lines in now. But again, I exercised massive restraint and decided not to do that. So yeah, there's some certain things that, you know, if I did this exact picture again, which I am quite tempted to do, I would change. And, you know, maybe I would just paint the sky and maybe just the red roofs of the houses. But John did say he tends to leave man-made things unpainted and natural things he'll paint. So that's why I made the decisions that I did. And I painted the hill and I painted the sky. So I was trying to keep his uh, his advice in mind um, for that. But I do like his tips on maybe taking a pencil and drawing a, a shape over the top and just painting inside that area. I do really, really want to try that out. Um, sometime soon so um, we'll see how that goes but to be honest with you I was like really happy with how this turned out I think it's got a little bit of John's magic in there 
maybe. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was either way, it was really fun to try this technique and how he works. And it was super awesome to speak to John. It's the first time I've ever spoken to him and I was so happy he agreed to have a chat with me. So please do check out his work. Um, he's on Instagram. He's got a great YouTube channel, so go check that out. And he's got an Etsy store as well where he sells originals. I think he sells prints as well, but he also has a copy of one of his sketchbooks in there as well, like a printed reproduction of his sketchbooks, which looks awesome. I really want to get my hands on that. So yeah, do go check out John's work. I really hope this video has been super useful to you guys and I will see you in the next one.